everybody, how's it going? This is Tim Jowsma, and with me I've got... My name is Kim. And we are here with another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. Imagine that, we're still here, yay! Yay! Get a clap. Um, for the past few months, I'm not going to go into details right here, because I'm sure very few people uh, would want to know, but I needed to take a break. Sometimes people, you know, life happens, you need to take that break to work on making yourself better and whatnot, when... Stuff happens, you know, I, uh, you know, one episode I uh, re released a couple months back, uh, you know, may give you some idea of what I was going through that where, uh, you know, I honor my friend Stephanie who did pass away from uterine cancer. It's just been a rough few months, but now we're in a spot to where we can bring the show back and into a much better spot too, in my opinion, because uh, with the new uh, podcast hosting service that we are using, Simplecast, one, as a Dutchman, it's much cheaper. Saving Yay. a lot of money is a good thing. Um, but two, most importantly, is that with Simplecast, they don't have limits in terms of how much you can upload to their servers per month. It's unlimited. Whereas the previous podcast hosting service I was using, Blueberry, um, did have a 250 megabyte uh, limit, size limit, which did, which was the main reason why, one of the main reasons why uh, we would always split the main topics in, in into episodes. You know, now granted, having, you know, a show like ours, you know, we're a bunch of nobodies to the mass, uh, you know, consumer market out there. So having a four hour topic on some of the stuff we talk about may not be the most appetizing but splitting it up into you know reasonable times is what we wanted to do however with simplecast with the un you know unlimited uh, upload things you know we can have a little bit of fun whether it's you know doing the regular friends talking nerdy bit that you know kim and i are going to be continuing on here or if you know m me or kim or somebody else gets some sort of f flight of fancy like a <laughs> Earlier this summer, the project that Maura and I, I had, the psychiatric hospital, we'll, you know, see, we, you know, we can give that a try as well. But this gives us a lot more options on what we can do. And also, I think uh, what we're going to be trying to do as well is kind of move more towards a more current topics, if that makes sense. You know, Kim and I have discussed it. She, I mean, she likes the show, but it's nice being able to have like a, a consistent weekly thing to where w when we're talking about something, it's what people are talking about now, not six months ago. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Although, um, I do like to live in the past sometimes uh, and some of the stuff we're going to talk about might not be so current, but it's stuff we like, and that's the whole point. Exactly, that's that's the point here. It's it's just I think the whole thing is it's you know moving more towards a weekly recording schedule will allow us to you know talk about what's more in the mood of of potential listeners if I haven't scared them off all already, um, but just more about what people are talking about in general. And to, to Kim's point, whether it's new stuff, classic stuff, or whatever. But speaking of that, you were watching a movie this week. Yes, I have a thing for uh, trashy movies, cult classic type movies, that sort of thing. And one of my sort of newish favorites is the movie Behind the Candelabra, which was done by Steven Soderbergh. Yes, that's Steven Soderbergh who did Aaron Brockovich and the Oceans movies and that great movie Traffic, which is another one of my favorites. Oh, out of Sight with George Clooney and that really the only yeah. Gen good Jennifer Lopez movie. It Okay, that's your opinion. I have opinions on that, but... Hey, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Behind the Candelabra, I think, is going to end up being one of those queer classics along the lines of Mommy Dearest, in my opinion, because it is so trashy that it's fabulous. And we're talking Michael Douglas plays Liberace, Matt Damon plays his, his lover Scott Thorson, and then we have Dan Aykroyd playing Liberace's manager. We have <laughs> Debbie Reynolds in heavy, heavy makeup, so you don't even recognize her, playing Liberace's mom. We have just, it is just so over the top and so kind of insane that I just I love it I absolutely love it now is it kind of like with Faye Dunaway I think she's come out and said that with her performance as Joan Crawford she was hamming it up for the camera oh I definitely think it there was a lot of Joan Crawford-esque performances going on there there was definitely some hamming it up for the for the camera oh and I almost forgot Rob Lowe plays <laughs> the surgeon and if anyone has seen this movie you know what I mean when I say oh my god Rob Lowe in this movie he is just like oh my God. you're getting the vapors type of good or? No, to some extent yes because he was just 
so over the top and so insane that you have to wonder why would anyone trust this man as a doctor because he's Rob Lowe. <laughs> no, just in general, if the, the real life doctor he's based on, if it's mm. anything like this character at all, how, 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 do, how do people trust these, these doctors? Oh my God, it's insane. And I mean, you end up seeing what he does to Liberace's face and to Scott Thorson's face. And you're just like, what were they thinking? Well, part of it, too, I can imagine is, you know, looking at medical procedures and how they were done in the 60s and 70s compared to how they're done today yeah. may seem barbaric. But also, the rich do have a tendency of spending a lot of money for medical procedures they don't need. Like, I know the movie Man on the Moon with Jim Carrey about uh, Andy Kaufman. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, we're talking like late 70s, early 80s is when yeah. all the surgery takes place. So. Oh, listen, I make it sound like a barbaric time, but that's when we were kids. So. In, you know, yeah, and in, in terms of like surgical techniques and things of that nature, it definitely was more barbaric than it is now. But still still anyway this movie if you haven't seen it it is on amazon prime free for amazon prime subscribers uh, it was originally on hbo it was uh done in 2013 and it's seriously if you like campy movies it's worth watching now i i because of who starred in it because of who directed it do you think that if this movie were made 20 30 years ago that we'd be talking about something that would be an Oscar darling, let's say, or was this the perfect movie for cable type of deal? How would you rank it? I think it's a perfect movie for cable kind of deal. So even so, it's in terms of quality, it's it's not it's not Ray, it's not anything like that. I think it's it's actually I think the filmmaking itself is is definitely quality. Okay. Well, of course, it's, it's Steven Soderbergh. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's it's well done, and they actually believe it or not, they used CGI for the piano playing. Because they show Liberace playing, but it, it they CGI'd Michael Douglas's hands playing oh. the piano. La, la, la. I yeah. mean, I think he learned some basics, but then they CGI'd all the fancy finger work. Because Liberace, say what you will about the man, he was talented. He was enormously talented. And a lot of his legacy has gone on in the form of music scholarships. A lot of his estate went towards a foundation for music scholarships for young folks, which is great. Yeah, and I think, if anything, too, it's it's one of those tales that it also showed why it is important for people to have that freedom to say, I'm a gay person. Oh, yeah, because he was in the closet for his entire life. He was, but... He was. It's like that. Op it, it, like it anytime an open he secret. open secret. Anytime he'd go on the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson would always goof. You know. You know. When are you gonna find that lucky lady? And you know he did in Liberace with a smile on his face. But I, I, I'm not a fan. I don't watch much Liberace footage on TV. But I could tell he was uncomfortable having to you know give the call. I don't know. Gosh, type of deal. Yeah, yeah. And it is. It is. It's good that nowadays people are just they're just out about it. I don't. I can't think of anybody, really, who's like an open secret gay right now. Yeah, I mean, I think pretty much anyone who was an open secret gay is now out. Or or, or a Scientologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's allegedly allegedly. Wink, wink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um. So apparently, Liberace was into wrestling, or he had something to do with wrestling. And my, I know you love wrestling. Uh, just a little. Yeah. Just a little bit. Well, yeah. when, it, when it comes to Liberace, um, you know, WWE fans uh, will know that uh, for the main event of WrestleMania 1, which is a tag team match between Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, facing off against Hulk Hogan and Mr. T, Liberace was the guest timekeeper. And it was, he, he comes into the ring with the Rockettes. With Start, the Rockettes? With the Rockettes. I know. I've never seen this, so. Uh, yeah, I'll, sh I'll show you I want, some. I'll have, to sh I'll have to watch this I'll after have to show we're some done footage. recording, yes. And um, also, too, there's like a great shot of him when the match is ringing and it, it match is going now. With the with the, the bell that they use, it's, it looks like a regular bell you'd find like at a boxing match or a UFC match. But Liberace had his own custom like crystal like handbell and he just picked it up. La, la, la. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, yeah, I have to watch. 
watch this. Definitely. It was amazing. And second, the second bit uh, was actually, um, I actually learned this from a, a documentary that WWE did on Bobby the Brain Heenan. Bobby the Brain Heenan is, well, is unfortunately, uh, was uh, one of the greatest managers ever. Just the quickest, sharpest wit ever um, but when he was a kid he lived with his mother and grandmother in uh, the Midwest and the, his mother and grandmother actually ran a hotel now in those days sometimes hotels were not what we think of now in terms of you know checking in and then you're only there for a short stay it was not a short stay hotel they were essentially apartments that they called a hotel and Bob then the hotel that they ran had Bobby Heenan's grandmother and mother Liberace's mother lived in that hotel so th there's another connection there. And it's funny, too, because Bobby was actually involved in uh, WrestleMania 1. He uh, managed uh, Big John Studd, uh, who faced off against Andre the Giant, a $25,000 body slam match. Um, nice. Andre ended up winning. Um, of course. Grabbed a bag of money and started throwing it to the audience. But then Bobby grabbed the bag from him and then ran in the back. So. Oh, man. I want to see that now, too. Okay, so you're going to have to line up a bunch of clips for me. Maybe we should... Um... Put these clips once you find them in the show notes. Uh, if we, it it depends on what the WWE has on their YouTube channel, okay. but we can definitely do that. But speaking of wrestling, this week is the most important week in professional wrestling history. That is not a hyperbolic statement. We got a couple major events going on um, today. As we record this, it's Tuesday. Tomorrow, Wednesday, is going to be the debut of a brand new national wrestling company's television show called AEW Dynamite. That sounds pretty huge. It is it it is huge because... Um, there hasn't been any new wrestling leagues or anything like that in a long time, have On there? that scale, no. Um, it, you know, there have been some that come along. There's some great uh, smaller promotions like Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling, uh, Major League Wrestling that are out there that do got television deals, but it's not on... You know, somewhere on cable, something like Ring of Honor, the company that owns them is Sinclair Broadcasting, the, mm. the group that owns a lot of local TV stations. They bought that wrestling company for um, <laughs> for uh, essentially cheap content. But I know you're cringing right now because of Sinclair Broadcasting. Yeah, Sinclair Broadcasting, I believe, are the ones who've been uh, making their news anchors say a bunch of pro-Trump stuff. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the And I think company. locally to us, that is KATU. Channel two, catch you. Yep. Bad. Yeah, I. It's been a while since it, 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 you know when those revelations came out. That was right about the time that the people that are involved in AEW were just making their split from Ring of Honor. Uh, um, the you know the group that uh, essentially started it. Uh, there's a tag team called the Young Bucks. Matt and Nick, Nick Jackson. You got the son of the legendary American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Cody Rhodes. He's uh, starting it up as well. Then you have um, you know the legendary Chris Jericho. Oh. Uh, he's their first uh, inaugural champion. He's a part of it, and he actually got uh, some online buzz. Uh, they they had their um, they had their last pay per view uh, at, the, at the end of August, I believe, before uh, the show starts uh, tomorrow, uh, called All Out. And Chris ended up winning the championship at that, which makes sense, you know, for a new show starting on a major cable network. Chris Jericho is their biggest name. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to give him the champ championship. But at the end. Of uh, the show, it was great. They had this long, continuous shot of him going through backstage, insulting everybody along the way, <laughs> um, and then he grabs some champagne and goes, "I'm going to get a bit of the bubbly." <laughs> Just made that a whole thing. Um, he ended up have <laughs> the night he won that championship belt. Um, th what they speculate happened is this because for a while they lost it. Oh. They put out a police report, and um, well, what they speculate happened is that at the end of the show, um, the, the, you know, Jericho had the championship in a special bag, and he put it on top of the limo, and they were putting stuff away. Oh. Then he gets in the car, and they think it's, it stayed on the limo, but then at some point fell off. Yeah, that's that's classic. Everybody, yeah. I think, has done that at least once with a cup of coffee or a soda or something <laughs> like that, but a bag with a championship belt? Seriously? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I again... He loves a bit of the bubbly, so there's That's that. That's true, but um, still the limo driver should have, like, You anyway, would think, you, you would think. think. Um, but th the funny part there, too, is that when it was lost and they had to call the cops, he did this great little 
promo at his house in his pool his luxurious estate as he called it and he said he alone was gonna uh, start a worldwide investigation to find it oh is this like an oj thing uh, uh, something like that yeah because after they found it the next day he was in his his luxurious mansion again you know le champion give an update about how he was able to get it back um so that that was funny he's doing the best mic work uh that he's had done for years but he's 48 and still wow. very much relevant now see here's what would have been funny now i don't know if you've seen this on the internet but the people who will steal like people's trolls out of their front yard or their gnomes or whatever they are and then take them around the world or around the country taking pictures and then sending them back to the owners they stole them from <laughs> Have you seen things like this online? No, that sounds funny. Though. It is really funny. Now, what would have been funny is if someone had done that with the belt and, like, gone to various capitals of the United States where there's iconic things like the Grand Canyon, the Statue of Liberty, the Arch in St. Louis, something like that, taken pictures with the belt and then posted them online or Instagram or something like well, that. Well, that's what I thought because... Because that know... would be fun. And, like, go to the different places that the tour was going to be going to. Well, I thought they were going to do something like that because, I mean, th they did make a legitimate police report and it's illegal to file one if you know that there oh, is no crime. okay. So, you know, the so fact that they... So he lost it. He really did He really, did, did, lock he really did, but still the fact that he was able to bring it ba bring it back into a, a wrestling angle uh, was amazing. And, and they could have easily done something like that, like make one now, of his... see, that would have been a fun know. stunt. Yeah. And if anybody uses that idea, I expect some compensation, please. <laughs> She'll hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that that is one bit of big news. And the second bit, bit of big news is uh, probably the most important thing to happen to the wrestling business in a long time. S WWE's show, uh, SmackDown, is moving to the Fox Network on Fridays. Oh. What was on Fridays before? nothing worth keeping on because now they have SmackDown. Now they have SmackDown. Okay, does and, this mean we have to get cable now? Uh, no. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's on Fox and I guess you'll be able to watch replays like on the Fox Sports app or something like that if you uh. want to. And then, of course, uh, the WWE Network when, uh, you know, after about a month, the older episodes cycle and, you know, onto the network. But, uh, you know, in the past, WWE had some special events like Saturday Night's main event mm -hmm. or the main event with NBC, but they did not have a traditional TV show. Now, some people may say, well, SmackDown was on UPN. UPN was never at the league of Fox, was never yeah. at the league of NBC or anything like that. Was it an over the, over the, you know, top uh, cable channel that anybody could get with a TV? Sure. But it wasn't at that level. It just wasn't. Well, the thing is too, is I don't think UPN was in every major network, whereas the Fox is Fox is on in every single major network in the United States. Yeah. Fox. It's interesting too, looking at the history of the uh, TV networks, because Fox essentially what Rupert Murdoch did was buy a lot of the, um, stations that uh, what did they call that UHF the, the, not UHF but there was another which is another the, good cult classic movie by the way <laughs> in the in the 50s there was another uh, another the Dumont network oh yeah so a, a lot of those because in the 80s like our, it, back home in Grand Rapids uh, Channel 17 WXMI was our Fox station but before that it was an independent uh, station where you know kind of like what Ted Turner originally did with TBS mm -hmm. before he decided to make it big just reruns left and right and then they would have first run syndicated shows like uh, Out of This World <laughs> remember that show it rings a bell, but I'm not... It's the teenager. It's about a teenage girl who finds out her um, father, her long-lost father is an alien. And oh. she can only communicate with him um, w with this orb uh, dealy uh, that she talks to. Kind of like Mork, uh, you know, talking to Orson at the end mm -hmm. of the show. Talks about her, you know, weekly adventures or whatnot. Um, but her father was voiced by Burt Reynolds. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll have to find a clip of this, too. Uh, maybe it needs to stay buried <laughs> if you remember <laughs> that show. But anyway, it's, it, you know, this is one of the most important weeks. And hopefully, um, because the, the, there's another t uh, show, too, on Wednesdays that WWE took from their network and then put on the USA Network now called NXT that's going to mm, be mm -hmm. shown at the same time as AEW. So, it you know, hopefully that can spur enough friendly competition between the two because wrestling at its best in the 90s it was at its best when wcw and the wwe were both at their top creative peak fighting against each other to get the best ratings so are we about to have a wrestling renaissance hopefully 
Hopefully. Hopefully. I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if, if I, there are seeds in place, there are, there's enough talent out there. I mean, if someone like Becky Lynch can come along and b- become a top name in a male-dominated industry, we got, you know, it, it, with the right storyline, with the right person involved, we could have, we could, yeah, it could make the 90s look like chump change. Cool. Yeah, and especially with AEW, too, one more thing about them is that they are actively pushing um, diversity in their talent as well. That's good, because, you know, that's what we need in general, is is more diversity. But it's proper diversity, too, because it's not like... It's not tokenism. No, it's not like what... Um, it's not like what WWE has done in the past and what other uh, wrestling promotions have done in the past too about, you know, if you're going to have a Mexican character, he's got to be stereotypical in some uh-huh. way type of deal. You know, like in AEW, they, there's a there's a performer there by the name of Nyla Rose. She's the first transgendered woman um, wrestler on that big of a scale ever. But, you know, during the course of the programming, it's, that's not really, t- they make it no secret, but it's not, they're not pushing. It's not like the focus of the storyline. It's, it's just like, here's, it, that's here she what is. she is. Exactly. And that's what I, I really like about what they're doing compared to, you know, what other uh, companies have done in the past. So That's cool. That sounds really cool. I'll have to watch some of this with you at some point. Definitely would, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if AEW is gonna have streaming of any any sort, but I'm sure they would be stupid if they didn't. Uh, yeah, I know they're doing their pay per views on the Bleacher Report uh, app, so I'll, I'll, you know by tomorrow we'll find out what happens. But you were reading a book this week. Tell us about that book. I I, I read a lot. I, I read usually two to three books at a time simultaneously on different apps, devices, in paper. One book for the left like eye, that. one for the right. <laughs> Something like that. So. I was reading this book this week um, by an author by the name of Jennifer Weiner. It's spelled Weiner, but it's pronounced I've Weiner. I've read her stuff before. She's a good author. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, her most recent book is called Mrs. Everything. And I checked it out from the library on my Kindle. Yes, our local library does Kindle books. Hooray! Yeah, it's excellent. And so I wasn't sure what to expect. I read a lot of different genres. I read a lot of historical fiction. I read a lot of fantasy, sci-fi I read what they call chick lit, which is just basically fiction focused towards women. Her bosom's heat. No, no that's like, that's <laughs> terrible romance is what you're describing. But no, this is, I, I guess this would fall into chick lit, but honestly, I don't think so. It's, it was so well written. It was much better than I expected. It basically follows the story of two Jewish sisters from Detroit and growing up, starting in the late 50s, early 60s, and on until the 2000s. And one is, um, you know, she's the pretty girl trying to please her mom and please her dad and all of that sort of thing. And the other one is a closeted lesbian. Hmm. And it follows them as they grow up and grow into their adulthood and their trials and tribulations. And I don't want to spoil the book, but there were a few parts where I was like, What? What just happened? What did they, I can't believe they did that to her sort of moments. And you know that's a, a, a sign of a good book, is when you get so invested in the characters that you're personally offended that something terrible happened to them. Oh, was it um, the fifth Harry Potter book, the introduction of Dolores Umbridge? Yeah. I hated that woman. Yeah, exactly. So you know what I'm talking yeah, about when I say yeah. you get to a point with a book. And then when the book ended... I did shed a little bit of a tear, and I don't do that very often. I, I, I read a lot of books. It's not often that I cry at the ending of a book. One of the last ones this happened with was... Um, Time to Play the Game by Tim Jones. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. It was uh, Magician, and I can't remember the name of the author. Raymond Feist. Raymond oh. Feist, Magician. Uh, there's it, It's published as one book in some countries and in two books in uh, the United States and other places. Anyway... I read it as a single edition because the copy I had was from Australia. Um, but that book made me cry. That book made me sob. So this book made me shed a couple of tears and it made me outraged at the, that they would do bad things to the character that I love so much. And I would, I definitely recommend it. And you can get it to the library. You don't even have to pay for it. It's worth reading. Yeah, I've read her stuff before. I know a book she wrote became a movie with Tony Collette and Cameron Diaz. I forgot the name of it, but that is the book that I, I read from her. And what I liked about that is how she was able to essentially relate the female experience in a way that 
me as a dumbass guy could read and, and, and could, could relate to. Yeah, she is very... I've read other books by her as well. Um, Jennifer Weiner, Mrs. Everything. That's the book I just read. Mm -hmm. um, I've read other books by her as well. She is very good at writing relatable female characters that have a lot of depth and a lot of soul, and they're not just sort of a... I don't... Mila Jovovich stick figure? No, they're. It, it's more like that they, they have character they have substance there's something to them and you you either really can't stand them or you root for them they, they they're characters that make you feel something and a lot of times you'll read books and you'll just kind of like la 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 go along go along and you finish the book and you don't really come back to it or remember it or want to talk about it and this book is one of those that you remember and you think about you want to talk about so if you're in a book group or a book club Something like that, where you get together and you drink wine and you eat cheese and you eat bread and you talk about books. This is a good book club book. There's a lot of stuff to talk about in here. Okay. All right. What um, do you want to talk about? Put me on the spot. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I what I read an article. Um, you know, one of the people I follow on Twitter is uh, a, a UK-based film critic by the name of B. Garner. Um, she uh. runs her own uh, website now called In Their Own League, uh, which is... Um, the the focus is film uh, reviews, film critiques, uh, the study of the you know filmmaking genre and whatnot um, through a, a female lens um, and also th like gender nonconforming lens as mm -hmm. well. Just not the traditional cis white guy, uh, the heterosexual you know cis male type type of thing that you can get anywhere else. Yeah, there are so many websites by men about movies. Yeah, like, like friends talking nerdy's website, <laughs> uh, and and you know, and to be clear, cis white male, uh, you know, comments on film is not a bad thing per se. It's just people should make that effort to kind of broaden their scopes. You know, yeah. s you know, see something through somebody else's point of view. And one article she uh, wrote that I wanted to talk about was uh, called "Feminist Film Theory One Hundred One." defining the male gaze i read the article you did what you i think? did read the article um i thought it was good i think it um it might have been i don't know when you when you see a title like that i guess i expected it to be a little more in depth but then again it's a good introduction to the idea of the male gaze and the idea of feminist film theory in general because not a lot of people think about that sort of thing especially uh Says that white guys. Yeah, um, I, I I think I, I get what you're saying about how uh, the article was written. I think her um, she she came from another uh, website as well. Um, you know, really good writer. Definitely recommend you following her and also her website. Um, but she. she primarily and it's really good that she does it this way. I've seen that she primarily writes in such a way to spur conversation. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what this goal was because I think that's what it kind of needs as well because I was reading it and I was thinking about um, some of the things. I mean, I'm a writer myself and one of my uh, characters that I absolutely love from what I wrote is, is a female assassin, uh, you know, uh, rare in today's world, um, but a female assassin by the name of Annie Walker and my uh, what I've wanted with that character and how I've written her and what I want to see from female characters in movies as, as well is different than what the male gaze has to offer you know when you have someone like a Luc Besson who uh, you know we saw his latest movie what was that oh goodness I know we did and totally forgot the name the because name... it was pretty generic you know what I got IMDb up over yeah. here you yeah I'll look but he has you know it's only been recently that I found out just what uh scumbag this guy is uh you know um was it no that was it was anna anna yeah yeah uh, formerly that, like, by know, the numbers yeah and that it was disappointing because i really like luke Besson. i've i've liked a lot of his movies in particular uh the professional and la femme nikita those Go two in particular but he does have the history of, uh, you know, what uh, B wrote in the article about it, utilizing the female. Oh, uh, yeah, female he gaze. definitely know. He definitely knows the male gaze. You mean? Yeah, because and what what uh, what she means by that is how women are can be presented in certain films as just 
they are there for the audience. It's kind of a voyeuristic thing. The women, you know, the women that fall into this trope of the male gaze are like the one example she made um, in in the article was Jessica Simpson in the Dukes of Hazard movie. Oh, that was a good example. You know, where she's walking in and you yeah, know opens up would, a trench yeah, coat. Yeah, exactly. And, she. That, I don't know. Did you ever see that movie? God no. Because I loved The Dukes of Hazard as a child. Well, so did I. And I time. saw that movie just because I was like, oh, I wonder if it'll bring back nostalgia. No, mostly I was just like frustrated and annoyed. Because, yeah, because, you know, in the TV show, Daisy Duke, she had, she had there was substance there. She wasn't just a chicken in a pair of, uh, you know, short shorts. And, you know, she had, there was something to her in... This movie, yeah. There is a difference. Yeah, I mean, because Catherine Bach, uh, who played Daisy Duke, I mean, there's a difference between a woman who knows she's beautiful and then uses that beauty in purpose of advancing her story in, in a particular movie or TV show compared to a woman who's simply there to look good to make the mm-hmm. audience titillated. Yeah, there's definitely a difference. Yeah, and, you know, I think of one of my favorite filmmakers, Robert Rodriguez, in two films he did, Desperado and Once Upon a Time in Mexico. It's, it, you know, the same characters, same actors. They're, you know, part two and three of his mariachi trilogy. Um, but in part one, uh, Desperado, uh, technically it's part two because El, El Mariachi is the first one for, you know, you hardcore film fans out there, I got to be precise. Um, but uh, with Desperado, that was Selma Hayek's first big Hollywood movie. And about mm-hmm. halfway through that film, there's a love scene that occurs that just stops everything dead. And it's just a way to kind of showcase, I, I think she had implants, let's put it that way. Just the, Selma Hayek? The, Selma Hayek. Just, I'm pretty sure she hasn't had implants. It looked like it, just because, you know, I mean, I'm a heterosexual male, so looking, you know, it's the you're, view you're a wasn't that. You're expert, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I watched enough Howard Stern and, you know, Aerosmith <laughs> videos in the 80s to, yeah. Uh, you know, it just, just, w- that was the focus, though. And it had no po- point other than to showcase her boobs, w- which is a nitpick, not really a compl- You get my point. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be goofy here, but, but the point is that did nothing for her character whereas in mm. once upon a time in mexico you uh, you see her introduction in the movie um she is comes out of nowhere she's dressed you know she looks amazing because she's salma hayek to, even today she looks amazing she is um hot. yeah she like moves aside her dress at the beginning taking out some knives and then throws it and you know kills a bunch of people and has a fight scene and that character, that same character from Desperado and Once Upon a Time in Mexico is so much more realized. So much, you know, she's she's still beautiful, sexy as hell. It's great to, you know, as, you know, if you, she's an attractive woman and it's okay to say someone's attractive, but it, it you ha- you got more out of her character this go around than you did in Desperado where she was just there to look like some hike. Do you think he, that he got criticism and that's why he changed it? I think he did because he, Robert, one good thing about him is that he does have a lot of strong women in that he works with, um, but also in his stories as well. Um, you know, think of the Spy Kids movies, uh, the mother, mm-hmm. Carla, Carla Gugino. I, I think that's how you pronounce her name, but she's a really, really good actress. Uh, she was also in his uh, movie Sin City, where she mm-hmm. played uh, Mickey Rourke's uh, probation officer. Um you know her you got uh Salma Hayek you know and you know her reputation as an actress speaks for itself and she does not exactly play two-dimensional uh characters like Amila Jovovich you know Mila Jovovich is great to a point I don't dislike her as an actress I think she definitely has some chops but a lot of her movies are meant to kind of showcase how she looks well do you think that might be because she was a model before she was an actress and so she's She's coming from training where she was supposed to push, as in push herself forward to look good because that was her job was to look good as a model. It's certainly possible that that could be it. But do they do the same with Jason Statham, who was a model? before he became a comparable actor? It, you know, just women are forced to 
consider how they look and consider being sexy on film whereas someone like jason statham can you know have five o'clock shadow wear a t-shirt and jeans and be more than fine for uh the female viewing audience out there if you know what i mean yeah but that's because we've been conditioned to expect less from men and that yeah and that's i i think the big taking point i i got from the article was that by recognizing you know what the male gaze is and there's also another term they had in their uh fighting fuck toy <laughs> which <laughs> you know it because i think you know like black widow in the mcu um when she first debuted yeah she, she did... was she had that fft vibe yeah and it, it, it was later on that the character was allowed to blossom and, and develop more well and... i think that was some of some of that was probably response to criticism because there are a lot of female comic book fans out there who were just like what are you doing? Hmm. What are you doing to our to our character? What are you doing to our girl? Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. I, at the end of the day, I, I, it's important to discuss this stuff so we know that it's there. If we don't know that it's there, then these negative. Because I do think the male gaze at the end of the day is negative. It boxes women into into objects and not people that you can explore that you can relate to that you can get something from and then that's the, you know the more i've brought tried to broaden my outlook in terms of point of view when it comes to it just stuff i like i mean in pop culture and whatnot you know the more i've tried to see things from others point of view i'm, I'm able to get a lot more from that and i think it, more people should keep that in mind i, I agree you know i agree Anyway, all right. So what we are going to do now? One, th uh, one thing Kim and I have been talking about. We're we're both big fans of music. Um, Kim, when she went to college, went to college for. Well, when I originally showed up at, I went to Oregon State University. Go Beavers. Um, Beavers. <laughs> 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 yes, in Oregon, the two major colleges are the University of Oregon Ducks and the Oregon State University Beavers. And I went to the better college, in my opinion, of course. Um, <laughs> but yeah, because beavers and ducks are huge to the state of Oregon. Um, they're the, sort of the unofficial mascot because that's kind of one of the reasons that Oregon was discovered and put on the map is because people came out here to trap beavers and steal their fur and make hats and coats and things out of it. So anyway. Get that beaver bling. <laughs> so anyway, I show up at Oregon State wanting to major in wildlife science and become a game warden i'm sure yeah you didn't know this about me yeah because i i love nature I hey, love boo -boo. Like no, not a park ranger a game warden they're two different things okay i was gonna join the oregon state police become a game warden but that got derailed because i got involved with the radio station at osu kbvr yes k beaver that was the radio station at OSU. I got involved with that. All beaver, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was into music before I got there, but boy, howdy, did that, did that expand my horizons with getting into the radio station. Because this was 1991. Hmm. This was the beginning of the grunge movement. And we and are recording in the Pacific Northwest we here. Are. So yes. Say some of the bands you saw. Oh, gosh. I've seen... Well, yeah, I've seen a lot of bands, a lot of indie bands. I've seen uh, Mud Honey. I've seen, um, gosh, oh, you put me on the spot. Now my brain is just empty. But no, um, <laughs> da, basically, da, 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 da. <laughs> basically, I've I've seen most of the indie bands that were coming up in the Portland and Seattle area in those days, and we played them on the radio. And we had a grand old time and I learned so much about music and about myself and all of that. It made me change my major. I ended up majoring in communication with a uh, minor in sociology. I have a bachelor's degree in communication, which has gotten me nowhere. But um, the things that I learned about myself in college have served me well. And actually, there are things for my degree that I do use every day um, as part of my job. So. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I, I am super into music. And my musical taste is definitely shaped by the time that I came of age. I, and I think that's that's uh, that's honestly most people. Because yeah. it's like the older you get, you're still, for the most part, stuck in that same group of bands yeah. that, you know, you liked growing up. And, you know, some people are able to still enjoy new bands. But I think at the end of the day, too, if you heard something in your formative years that 
20 years later someone else who was inspired by that makes their mm -hmm. own version of it you're gonna want to stick with the original yeah pretty much but um i think you guys will see as you listen to the series of podcasts we're going to be recording how my music taste is definitely shaped by the fact that i was working in radio in the early 90s and tim's tim was not so tim's <laughs> taste yeah. is much different than mine yeah but i think that we uh we can come to a consensus about some things well, and it's not about coming to a consensus per se. It's just about enjoying music, you know. Whether, yeah, that's true. You know, if you know we're, what we'll do is talk about an album each week that you know we enjoyed. This week is going to be my choice uh, from the Rolling Stones. It's the album "Tattoo You." Uh, so we'll go down track by track, talk about our thoughts. If we do got, uh, if I do have some stories that I can relate in terms of what was happening at a particular point in my life that I can relate to that song, then you know we'll throw that as uh, throw that out there as well. But you know we're gonna do that you know kind of week by week because even if you don't like a particular set of music, you know when you hear a friend passionately talk about something that they enjoy, it does make you closer to them, even if you don't necessarily enjoy it as well. That's true. You know, because at the end of the day, music appreciation, it, 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 the, the opinions are subjective. You know, there are certain guidelines in terms of how you can rank the best guitarist ever uh, ever made in terms of, you know, their ability and whatnot. But, you know, give me a good Ramon song any day type of, type of deal. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. What year did this album come out? This album can't... You don't want to hear me stammer anymore. <laughs> uh, this album came out in 1981. Um, How old were you in 1981? Uh, I, was, I was five. Yeah, so that album is... It's interesting when uh, they came up with it. Uh, what it was is that they um, were just getting off the Emotional Rescue Tour from 1980. And they wanted to tour again in 81 and early 82. But didn't have enough of their own, own original material to put out an album. So... They had one of their producers kind of go back in in the because they had an amazing string of hits in the 70s um going from sticky fingers all the way to start me up the most seminal rock albums ever made um but they had a lot of stuff that was not complete so they had a producer go through take some of the best tracks they re reworked them and were able to come up with the album that we know today and uh, track number one on the album, on what, <laughs> that's another thing too, we, when we wanted to talk about albums, this album is formatted to, to where if, if you bought it when it was a cassette or as a, as a record player, side one of the album is the more up-tempo up rock beats, more, you know, intense grooving t type stuff. Side two is kind of the more the ballad section. So uh, side one, track one, their most I iconic song ever made, Start Me Up. Yeah, Start Me Up has been, I think if you go to any sports stadium anywhere in the United States, you're going to hear Start Me Up at some point during the game. Yeah. I mean, I have I know I've heard it uh, many times when I've gone to see uh, Trailblazer games, um, that sort of thing. Because everybody knows it. It's a classic. You can't go wrong with it. I mean, there's nothing bad you can really say about it. It's it's a it's a pretty good song. Everybody, you know, you can just kind of like you hear it and you like, da -da -da. you just hear the beginning. And everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah. And everybody starts rocking. It's just one yeah. of those songs, and I can't say anything bad about it. Yeah, um, this song is the song that started me on my musical journey. You know, when I was, it started you up pretty much yeah um you know when i was five um this little thing called mtv first debuted um where in 1981 uh to, to where they would show just music videos and one of the first music videos i ever remember seeing was start me up from the rolling stones and oh, I miss, it, miss mtv when they played music videos uh, yeah oh it was so fun well, I mean, YouTube is better for that nowadays, True. thank goodness. I mean, because then you don't, the beauty, with a good app blocker, you don't have to worry about commercials. But the beauty of MTV is you never knew what was coming next. And so you got exposed to a lot of different music that way. And I, I do wish there was more of that, but I, I, I don't think we'll ever get back to that just because no. with streaming the way it is. You you know, I mean, Pandora had the right idea, but then when you have something like Spotify, Apple Music come out, where you can create your own playlist uh, from there. I like, I like being surprised. I wouldn't have, I, you know, even now, I wouldn't have been exposed to some of the bands that I actually like now, some of the pop stars that I actually enjoy now, if it hadn't been for, like, Pandora. Cause, oh, yeah. Because, like, I did a... 
All right, don't laugh at me. I did a Britney Spears channel on Pandora, and they started throwing in Rihanna songs. And mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I really like Rihanna. And, yeah. I know. <laughs> when you guys when you guys realize what my taste in music goes <laughs> from, you're, you're going to totally laugh at the fact that I also like Britney Spears and Rihanna. Well, uh, you know, uh, Britney, I, I would put in, like, the category of uh, of an artist who, I, there are, like, one or two tracks that I like with hers. It's Toxic. You oh, can't go wrong with that. That's a great song. Yeah, that just she she you could tell she lived that 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 was a passion project for her. You know, she was able to bring out so much on that song. Anyway, let's go back to release. <laughs> All right, um, but yeah, I remember. I mean, just as a kid, I think the thing that amazed me about them was you know seeing what I termed old people at the time having so much fun. <laughs> you know, it, it, it it's part of, you know, growing up where I grew up in Michigan and, you know, my, my circumstances and whatnot. But just seeing, you know, the goofy, rubbery guy, Mick Jagger, jumping around on screen and, and you know, uh, even at five, seeing Keith Richards, you're like, that's a cool motherfucker right there, <laughs> you know. And they just seem to be having so much fun when in reality during that time, that was about the time they started having some of their most their worst internal strife as a band and almost broke up but you know you could never tell uh from the videos that they have hmm. i don't know i've never really watched a rolling stone video honestly yeah. I've, i haven't i just um i mean i know like most of the rolling stones like big hits because mm-hmm. um i grew up listening to like am radio with my parents in the car and stuff like that mm-hmm. so it's like i've always known a lot of the songs but i just never I never deep. This is the first time I've really ever like dived into one of their full albums that is like a greatest hits thing. Okay. So. And she's like, "Thanks, Tim." No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know, I know, I know. Uh, all right, so track number two on side one is "Hang Five. Hang Fire. It's not a classic. Is it "Hang Fire" or "Hang Five? "Hang Fire. "Hang Fire. Okay, because I was totally hearing "Hang Five. so I was thinking it was like a play on like "Hang 10. so there was like sort of a. Sur- like they're kind of making fun of surfers in a way. Well, it's, it's Mick. <laughs> no, Mick Jagger is notorious. It's such a <laughs> they're mocking surfers. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, then they have a you know kind of like a the hip hop award. Is it like the Biggie versus Tupac? It was like the Beach Boys versus the Stones because of this. You know, they start throwing beach balls at each other. Oh my god, explosive beach balls. Yeah. Or beach balls filled with cement because of the Rolling Stones. And... Never mind, you <laughs> bitch. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but Hang Fire, it's a pretty solid number. Not a classic by any, any sense I don't of the know. term. If, if it gets me kind of nodding my head and rocking out a little bit when I'm listening to it, hey, it's a, that that's a win in my book. Yeah, and uh, you know the the thing with this song too, like what when you know sometimes I would do chores and whatnot, you know just as a kid having an album on, you know, kind of helped sp- oh, yeah. spur that along. And songs like this definitely, uh, you know, kind of kept it, it kept the the tempo up. You're dancing a little bit and having fun. Again, not a classic by any sense of the term, but if you hear it on the radio, definitely enjoy it. This is oh, yeah. a good one. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Um, the next two songs, though, boy, I'm not <laughs> yeah. a big fan. Track three, a song called Slave. The whiny, whiny vocals. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, the music, the actual instruments. Yeah, da-da, da-da, the instruments da-da. were great. It, I was I was down for the, like, the blues feel to it. Mm-hmm. But then the vocals come in. I'm just like, what the? Mm, oh, my <laughs> God. They're terrible. It's awful. I don't. I, I, I've listened to the track three times, and I cannot get past the vocals. If the vocals were not quite so whiny, or there was like, or they were more sultry, I would be fine with it. You, you gotta, you gotta blame Marvin Gaye, and here's why. That's right around the time that Marvin Gaye uh, released a song called, I believe it's called "Got to Give It Up," uh, the one that Robin Thicke uh, stole for Blurred Lines. Oh, and uh, Marvin Gaye sang that in falsetto. And oh, so so Mick was Mick essentially. Was like, I need to try falsetto. Yep. Well, Mick, you failed. <laughs> you failed. That's terrible. Yeah, it because the previous album, Emotional Rescue, the 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 title track was all for no, not all, but ninety five percent was done in his falsetto voice. I enjoyed it, but I can understand why it's not everybody's cup of tea. Because... I can handle a falsetto if it's good. Yeah. This was awful awful yeah i mean the the, the, the 
the way he sings it, you don't really understand the lyrics. So in the past, I usually just drown that out and just kind of just go along with that. Yeah, see, that's what I did. I was like, I was like, okay, starting out good. I'm like getting into it and all of a sudden the vocal I'm like okay can I block the vocals out no no I couldn't <laughs> stop I know basically I'm like stop <laughs> why are you ruining it well uh, I'm sure I, I want to hear what you say about the next track uh, track four in side one is uh, Keith Richards only contribution to the album little TNA so Keith Richards did he sing it or did he write it yes he sang it he in sang the... it and wrote it yeah it's bad <laughs> I don't like it why is that because it's misogynistic because because you can talk about a woman without being so freaking misogynistic it's just like like a tna bitch and bitch and blah 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 and yeah no 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 <laughs> it's another one of those where the music part was fine if it was just instrumental i would have been down with it so you're saying it's the male gaze in music form? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, B. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, not not a fan of the lyrics, not a fan of the way that they were sung. And um, yeah, I'm going to have to give it a hard pass. Yeah, I mean, for me, it kind of represents malehood as a whole, malehood in their 20s. Plus, plus, this song and I think um, Slave both suffer from the uh, too much 80 saxophone problem. I'm not guessing... everything not everything needs a saxophone solo and I know a lot of a lot of music at this time that was the kind of rock and roll genre in the 80s kind of had a saxophone solo as kind of par for the course and I'll disagree on that uh, you know Bobby Keys their main uh, saxophonist and I know a couple of the other tracks too it did have other uh, saxophone that was a players lot of saxophone. yeah they, they you know and, and for, for me I had no problem with it um, I, I can a little saxophone is fine. A lot of saxophone, <laughs> unless you're unless I'm listening to a jazz album. I don't like a lot of saxophone. Well, it depends on the song too. Like uh, one song I like when I walk. If it's like dusk out or dark, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a light rain. Mm -hmm. One perfect song I, I love to listen to in the rain is Jungle Land from Bruce Springsteen. I haven't heard it. It's uh, it, it's the last track on side two um, on the Born to Run album. Um, but there's th the most amazing sax solo from Clarence Clements that you'll ever hear. But if you hear it in those conditions when you're walking in the rain, it just feels amazing. I mean, I like I like a good saxophone solo in the right way. It, it just I didn't <laughs> didn't like it on this album. I didn't just like did it. not like it. It was too much. Okay, too much saxophone. No worries. Now we'll move on here to track five, and that is the blues number, Black Limousine. That one I liked. I was jamming to that one. That is th th one of the few uh, songs that I was have ever been able to play on the harmonica. You can play the harmonica? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been years, but it, yeah. I learn something new about you all the time. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I liked the blues growing up, thanks to my love of the Blues Brothers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, one reason I got the hat that I got, I guess. But uh, you know, I was able to you know teach myself to play the harmonica. That's cool. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to hear you play the harmonica now. Mm -hmm. Not right this moment, but yeah. at some point. No, I think Bob Dylan would laugh at my skills now. It would take some time to get uh, back to if, uh, <laughs> Bob. Like Bob Dylan's gonna hear you play the harmonica. Yeah, fuck Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our next track, uh, the track that ends side one. Um, hey kids today, what's a side one? How do you? Yeah, exactly. Well, back in the day, before there were CDs, you had cassette tapes or you had records, and records have two sides. It's that, flat. Well, so does a cassette tape. It's flat like the Earth, and <laughs> he's giving me the greatest look right now. No, no, there's no such thing as flat Earth. The earth is a sphere. Um, no, but records are flat. You flip them over, side one, side two. There was usually some kind of thought behind what songs went on either side. And now with CDs, it all just runs together. And same with tapes, because yeah. tapes were basically s scored the same way as records. Yeah, and it because Frank Sinatra was the first, to, while there were albums before Sinatra, what he did in the 50s, Frank was the first one that kind of figured out that an album was an experience and if you place a particular group of songs in a particular way it can tell a story i bet that it wasn't him who discovered that it was probably one of his producers who talked him into it you get my point 
<laughs> he's the first one that is is associated with ha- with the album concept as so thank you frank um, sinatra's producers yeah you did you a know, good job they do you don't um but anyway <laughs> what i don't know what the, i go from sinatra to rodney danger <laughs> because i think of that old my favorite danger field like two of them um like one is in caddyshack where he goes to the old lady how would you like to earn 14 dollars the hard way um, i don't even know what that means but it just sounds so dirty um and then there was another one that was uh my wife says she wanted to put a mirror above our bed i asked her why she said i love to watch myself laugh <laughs> you know? um, so but that's it, actually a decent impression i gotta say yeah when you grew up watching TV a lot, you'd had time to do stuff like that, you know, learn impressions. <laughs> but um, anyway, the track, the end side one, Neighbors. Eh. It's kind of, it's eh. kind of, it's, it belongs in the, in the category with Hang Fire, uh, with me. It's. No, Hang Fire is better. Uh, but still, it, it, they're both Hang good. Hang Fire had me jam and Neighbors, I was kind of like, eh. They're both good-ish, but they're not at the they're not they're not at start me up level. They're not at brown sugar level. It's not a classic from them. It's just enjoyable, but once it goes away, you're not really, you know, you're, you're it, it's not memorable. Yeah, I would agree because I I'm honestly not I can't think of the lyrics or anything right now. It's obviously not memorable because yeah I'm not remembering it, and I've listened to the album three times in the last forty eight hours. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so the we'll go to side two. It, you know, pretend children that you take the physical media out of your iPods or whatever you listen to your fucking music, and then you switch it over, and then you start. <laughs> Walkman. I remember having a Walkman. Oh yeah. I actually had a real Walkman. My parents went all out and and bought me a Sony Walkman, and not like generic like walk buddy or something like that i was i, I got lucky for christmas that year i didn't even get the walk buddy um <laughs> you know by and to her credit she tried i'm not knocking my mother but you know she would get the cheapest possible um you know like like cassette players or whatnot and you know and, that would be something that my mom and my dad would probably do but i don't know what possessed them that year we must have had a good year Mm-hmm. Financially, I don't know, but I had I got a real Sony Walkman. I was so excited, and I, I find out they were selling cocaine at the time. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if you if you ever met my parents, you would know that was so not the case. My parents are such nerds. They so, met in computer school in the late sixties. Nerd. No. Yeah, my, my you think I'm a nerd? My parents were proto nerds. They were nerds before nerds were a thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> they were sending love notes in binary. You know, one, exactly. One, zero, zero, they one, probably one, zero, did. One, they probably wrote them each other love notes in binary. I could totally see. I could totally see my mom doing that for sure, and my dad being like, "What the hell's this? <laughs> do, do I run now?" <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is this going to be like Fatal Attraction? Is, is there a bunny in here? No. <laughs> All right. Um, side two. It starts off the ballads. And this is the, the first track, Worried About You, I think right now is my uh, my favorite track on the album. I liked it. It, it didn't, it, it's not like it's going to replace one of my all-time favorite ballads or anything like that, but I thought it was a good song. This one has a bit of personal meaning for me. Um, involves you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Story I'd never told. It was the end of December uh, 2017, uh, the last week, in fact, and a uh, rough day because the previous day there was a woman that I had dated for a while that, you know, we had a bit of a rough breakup. And oh, no. Is it, the, is it that woman? Yeah. Oh, no. Um, and it's one of those deals for a long time. I was angry and whatnot, but, you know, hindsight being 2020. I messed things up on that just as much as, you know, she potentially did as well. Just we we didn't really talk, you know, mm. just we both let stuff fester. And then, you know, it it blew up from there. It was going to it was going to end bad. Um, but anyway, the last time the, when I the last time I texted her, which was the previous day in December, um, I had started I had heard that she got into a car accident. So I just sent the text, you know, I, you know, I know we're not talking, but I'm glad you're OK type of deal and then she responded back that she didn't want to talk to me and then you know i got upset and then it was just a whole day of just stuff that shouldn't have been said 
Mm. You know, and then, you know, the next day, the day in question, um, I was supposed to go to a friend's birthday party that they were having at a, a bar. And, you know, it was the friend was a coworker and there were some other coworkers that were going to be there. And I knew them, but didn't really know them. And, you know, you've, you've seen me out in public around people that I don't know as well. I was, you know, nervous as hell. I, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't talking. And, but, you know, during that uh, time that I was there, I received one last text from her. And just basically never want to talk to you again. And I got no problem with that. But it just wasn't something I wanted to hear at that time. And it just was really, really just dark, dark, dark. So I left that bar um, about 1030-ish, was going to catch the last bus home. It was raining out. It was about 1030 at night. Then this song came on. Oh. Yeah. But what I like about this song is that the good thing about a good, sad song is that the music can still find a way to lift you up. Because it is definitely sad. It's about a guy that's losing his, you know, losing what, losing the woman he's with for very explainable reasons on both sides but there's still that hope that there will be that girl out there in the future Mm. you know type Mm -hmm. of deal and um you know the lyrics do definitely kind of uh reflect that as well but the main thing that got me walking uh to the bus stop in the rain was how was the guitar solo oh yeah it does have a really good guitar solo yeah and you know that you know when i got to the bus stop i was just emotionally drained started crying and all that um yeah it was what it was but and you know like i you know like i said there was still plenty of time to where i had to you know get over all the you know nonsense that me and the other woman in question both put ourselves through um but You know, I do think that that song just was kind of the reminder I needed at that time that, you know, it's okay for a bad relationship to end. In fact, it's good when a bad relationship ends. You don't always know it at the time when you're in the middle of it, but it's a good thing. Yeah. And it's while it's important to acknowledge, you know, your role in how a relationship ends mm-hmm. and, you know, and sometimes that can take a while. I can say that from experience. Yep. You know, it's important to acknowledge that and then to appreciate the gifts that come you, your way, um, you know, in, in the future if you just let something slip. You know, I mean, the, re- the, the reason I brought, th- one reason I brought this up too is that I do feel foolish because during the angry times, uh, there were a handful, and I'm literally talking one handful of t- times where I, you know, th- threw out insults. And that was below me. I didn't need to do that. And, you know, again, I, it's good that that relationship ended, you know, because I'm in a much better spot and with a much better person um, for me. Not that she was a bad person. You get mm-hmm. my point. Yeah. But um, it's, it, it just brings me back to that time and it makes me remember that hope that it gave me. It's always good to reflect. Yeah. And to remember and then to you know, realize what mistakes you've made before and how to avoid making them again. Yeah. I mean, it's the whole, like we need to learn about history in general in order to not repeat it. And we should apply that to our relationships as well. Exactly. I mean, it, it, the big thing it taught me was if something's bothering you, say something. Yeah, <laughs> you know, pretty because... much. You, you got to do it or else it just festers to the point where you can't, where it ends up breaking things up sometimes. Yeah. And that's what it did here because, you know, while I still have legitimate issues with what happened during that time, if I had been able to properly articulate that to her, there's a good chance things still would have ended, but it would have been a lot more amicable and mm-hmm. we could have potentially have been friends. Yeah. So it it's a song, it's a personal choice for me why I like it for, for a number of reasons. And, you know, and anyway... You get my point. I get your point. All right. The next song, Tops. What'd you think of that? Yuck. <laughs> Why is that? Just yuck. I didn't, honestly, I didn't like any of the rest of the songs on the album. Mm. Just for various reasons. Either I didn't like the lyrics, or I didn't like the way the vocals sounded. For the, for the most part, though, the music itself, the instrumental music, is good. I, I, I think the Rolling Stones are very talented musicians. Yeah. I don't think they're quite as talented in terms of lyrics and vocals. 
Oh, fair enough. I mean, I, this song was one of the, you could tell when they uh, originally wrote this, it was around the time they did Goat's Head Soup, which was 73. And you could tell it was a song from the early 70s. Wait, Goat's Head Soup? That was the name of one of their albums. Oh, okay. For a minute, I thought that was some kind of weird drug no. that I'd never heard of before, like some weird name for a brand of heroin or, or LSD or something like that. <laughs> I don't know the origins, so it's certainly possible <laughs> that it was in reference to that. But it had that early '70s kind of R and B, um, R and B yeah, group type it of. It did. It didn't quite fit with the rest of the album. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the weaker tracks. It's not the weakest on the album. What do you think I, is the weakest on the oh, album? Oh, for me, it's it's the next two, "Heaven" and "No Use in Crying." Um. Yeah, I didn't like "Heaven" either. Yeah, uh, those were Heaven both. Heaven was awful. Yeah, it was up on it was up on the little TNA and the slave level for me of awful. Uh, to me, I just didn't like it because even uh, even you mentioned with something like slave, for instance, the music itself. Yeah, was, it's was the fun. vocals. It's the, the like eh, and the whining. Oh my god, it's so whiny. Yeah, <laughs> so whiny, whiny. But it, tops was okay because I I imagine it too of how like how it starts. It's like a every what is that opening lyric. I don't know. I'm not the fan. You're the fan. You should know this. But <laughs> well, yeah. Bring up a random lyric from REM. I mean, you know, you're not gonna do it. just because you're maybe a fan of a particular group doesn't mean you know all their lyrics. Uh, I might. <laughs> it's like um no, it's just the way it's like every man is the same. Come on, and he, he just opened the song that way, and then just how they had like the background sing. He was the he did the background vocals for it, but it made it sound like that. There was like a doo-wop band behind them, kind of. It, it it just was an odd combination. It's it's not something that stood the test of time. Um, heaven, no use in crying. We both didn't like it, so there's no reason to yeah, go on let, from there. Yeah, let's um, the last one we disagree on. Um, waiting on a friend. That's the the, the second. Uh, this in terms of sales and popularity, overall popularity, mm -hmm. it's the second most popular song from this album, g generally among fans. Um, but what did you think? I didn't like it. Why is that? The lyrics. There was something. I'm, I'm looking up the lyrics right now because uh, there was something in the lyrics that I remember just being feeling kind of offended by so one moment <laughs> okay do, do, do. <laughs> well the, the the for folks at home while we're waiting here the video uh opens up uh with uh a shot of an apartment building in new york city um but that apartment building for eagle-eyed rock and roll fans um they will re recognize it as it was the same one that led zeppelin used for oh what was the physical graffiti uh, the, with the album they had, the double album they did with Cashmere, but I think you found the lyrics. I did find the lyrics. It was the lyrics. Don't need a whore. I don't need no booze. Don't need a virgin priest, but I need someone I can cry to. I need someone to protect. So basically, it's... I don't need a whore. Okay. Good for you. So you don't need a whore. But you're looking for... A, you're not waiting on a lady. You want a friend. Okay. So basically, you're looking for some woman to absorb your emotional turmoil and then turn her out an emotional tampon basically yeah that's the that's the impression i got it was just like this guy like i'm just so sad i need some woman to come for me but i don't need a whore i don't need a whore i don't need to get drunk <laughs> i don't need a priest but i need someone to cry to it sounds like some guys that i've dated honestly it sounds like some of the whiny bitches that i've dated and better not be me damn it no <laughs> <laughs> Dude, quit projecting. <laughs> but no, I'm, I just... I just, I don't like the fact that they use the word whore a lot in their songs. There was like little TNA, I think, used the word whore as well. It just, I just don't like it. I mean, I know it's, it, they were written a product of their times, blah, 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 written in the 80s. Still, I just... just meh. Bleh. That's pretty much my impression of that song. Yeah, and I think a lot of that too comes from the fact on who's writing it. Um, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards <sighs> yeah, aren't exactly are cranky old men, basically. Uh, and how old were they when they were? They're old enough to know better. Late thirties, early forties. Yeah, old enough to know better. You don't call women whores. But about knowing better too, you got to imagine those guys were uber rich for yeah. at least a decade, so they're getting everything they want no matter what. Exactly. So, so why are they whining? 
They Gosh. get everything they want. They can have whoever they want, obviously. They were both dating some of the most beautiful women in the world. But I need a friend. Where? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling sorry for you, and I'm not buying Did it. Did you ever see that Jerry Hall uh, reality show? No. I would I would need a friend, too. <laughs> Just I, in in some ways, I felt bad for her, but it was the reality show to, that she did to find a boyfriend after she left Mick Jagger. Oh, jeez! And it just was the saddest thing. <laughs> I, you know, she was also in um, Batman, nineteen eighty nine. She was. Oh, that's right. She was. Yeah, she played she was, one of the Jokers. She was the Joker's girlfriend, Jack Girlfriends. Napier's girlfriend before he became the Joker. Yeah. Um, I, I love that line he gives, gives up. Not even a line. Just, uh, yeah, it was a line. She goes, comes up behind him and goes, you look fine. And he goes, I didn't ask. And then she had had her hand on his shoulder and he just looked at it like it was the most disgusting thing in the world. And then he turned and walked away. Just, if I pulled that off, You'd want to punch me in the face, but I Nich probably would punch you in the face if you did that to me. But Nicholson pulls it off. You're like, that's the coolest guy around. <laughs> you know? Just some people can pull off asshole better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't mean that I want to date them. I yeah. I I you your know, bad boy stage is done. Right? Exactly. I'm at a point in my life where it's like I don't want to waste my time on people who are just jerks. Yeah. Jerks, assholes, whatever you want to call them. I don't have time for that. I just I don't have time for it. I don't want it. I don't need it. Yeah. Done. Agreed. <laughs> so that is Tattoo You from the Rolling Stones. What did you think of the album? Did it change your mind on the Stones? Um, not really. Uh, basically, they're still going to be a greatest hits band for me. Okay. There are songs that I like. There are songs that I don't like. I'm probably not going to be seeking out any of their other albums to listen to. They're just going to be a greatest hits band for me. And I'm I'll sorry you if that hurts it your... on me. Yeah. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. No, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Okay. Um, and w she's using the term that I use as well. Um, mm -hmm. if, she, if she agrees with how I label music. I mean, you got bands that you just don't like. You got bands like me with Britney Spears. And I'm sure, you know, you have bands too that you may like one or two hits, but not enough exactly, to really not call yourself to a like, fan. Exactly, or to buy like their entire catalog or something like that. And yeah, I'm... then you have the greatest hits to where, yeah, you would actually buy, like, I'm not going to buy Britney Spears' greatest hits album, but I will buy, you know, Bruce Springsteen greatest hits for instance he's on my greatest hits list yeah well and you don't have to buy Britney Spears greatest hits because I already did so you can just listen to my copy no, who says I don't already no, I... <laughs> <laughs> probably does when I'm not hey, home me baby <laughs> <laughs> there's that image for everybody <laughs> six foot four six foot five balding white guy just dancing around in a mini skirt in a plaid mini skirt I uh I'm going to whore it up right now. Let's go. <laughs> We're going to dance to some Britney Spears. We're going to whore it up. And... Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Baby, baby. All right. So for me, I will say this. Tattoo You is not my favorite Stones album, but it has my favorite songs from the Stones. Um, I think they have more solid albums overall. My absolute favorite is Emotional Rescue, the album they did before this, because uh, from start to finish, it's the most consistent. And I would rather look for, I, to me, the best albums aren't, aren't from the bands I like, aren't always the ones that the general public thinks are the greatest. They're the ones that just, from start to finish, feel like it's all, to, all in one cohesive group. So yeah. why didn't you have me listen to that album instead? These album uh, because start me up was the, the literally the song that started my musical journey. Okay, you know, all right, gotcha. Th that's the most important thing. No, right there. that's that explains it right there. Yeah, I mean, because without it, it, I, I'm sure I probably would have discovered them some other way. But you know, this is the line in the sand. There before, you know, before start me up. I, I'm sure I did like music, but nothing, st nothing stuck. Nothing stuck like start me up. And if you're gonna start a musical journey, that's one hell of a way to do it. Well, obviously, it stuck with a lot of people because, like I said, you hear it everywhere. When you go to a sports stadium, you're going to hear it. And that's the bad thing, too, because sometimes those those songs like that, like Ironic from Alanis Morissette, like, you know, We Will Rock You from Queen, they get played so much that you don't really appreciate just how good they are. That's true, but at the same time, I don't go to a lot of sports events, so it's kind of a treat when I get to hear it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like we said, uh, this is a kind of a feature that we want to start doing on a consistent basis with uh, just us here. So um, next week, 
What do we expect to listen to? What's going to be your choice? What am I? Gonna... I am honestly. Is this going to be am... payback? For... No, it's not going to be payback. <laughs> it's not a payback situation. I'm honestly, I my I'm up in the air. I have a couple of item, items in mind, but um, yeah, I don't want to. I haven't I haven't made my final choice yet. Okay, leave me in suspense. So... I will leave you in suspense. Ooh, All ooh, right. Ooh. Ooh, hey. Well, then with that, I think uh, let's wrap it up. We'll wrap Sounds up good. the latest episode here of Friends Talking Nerdy. We are back, people. We're not going to go away. Um, like I said, we did have our hiatus, but that hiatus, we're in a spot to where we can start putting out regular content again. So we hope to entertain you. We hope uh, you subscribe. Our show is available on all major outlets that carry podcasts. And if an outlet does not carry us, it's not big enough. <laughs> You know, so j- j- keep listening. D- help us out by spreading the word on the show as well. If you like what you hear, share it on social media. You know, share the links where we I, we have a new podcast domain up. FriendsTalkingNerdy.com has gone away. It's been replaced by FTNPodcast.com, which I thought was a little more precise. Sure. Um, and, and better. I mean, a minor quibble on my part, but I'm always changing things left and right. But if you like what you hear spread it around we want to you know build up our audience again here so um with that we will see you next week see you next week all right i guess i'll just have to have my own celebration won't i since nobody else seems to be here that's fine i'm an only child i got no problem celebrating by myself look at this look at this look at that cheap salami that's what chris jericho gets bunch of crap look olives look at this Look, this olives are nothing in there. And you look at this one. There's a little guy in there. Can't even get proper olives, can you? What else we got? Oh, a little bit of the bubbly. Want some bubbly? Look at this stuff. Huh? Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.